Thank you so very much, Marcin. And it is with great pleasure that we welcome back, and I'm going to let you explain the welcome back part, uh, uh, Minister Dovgilevich, uh, to be with us uh, today. I could go through a resume that will uh, astound you, but to highlight uh, his work, he currently serves as the Secretary of State for European Affairs and Economic Policy at the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but uh, he has spent a great deal of time and in Brussels. He has served as an advisor to Pat Cox, uh, the former president of the European Parliament. He has served as a key spokesman uh, for the uh, European Commission's International Relations and communi Communications strategy. He has served um, uh, Margot Wallstrom uh, in the um, cabinet of the vice president and uh, European Commission and certainly has been most recently very engaged in the Council of Ministers. So we have uh, a colleague who knows the inner workings of Brussels and I hope will shed and share some light of those inner workings particularly as they apply to East, uh, the Eastern Partnership. But finally, let me just say, um, we are grateful for Poland's leadership uh, of the Eastern Partnership Project in close cooperation with the Swedish uh, government. This is the type of leadership we need to see from Europe as it tackles these important issues. And uh, we are going to hear now from one of the architects of that uh, leadership plan. So without further ado, Minister, we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Heather was referring to my comeback or return to the CSIS because I mentioned to her last night that uh, 11 years ago when I had the pleasure and privilege to work for late uh, Professor Bronisław Geremek in his cabinet, he sent me here on a short fellowship to CSIS with a few Polish suffers uh, who are, all of them are doing quite well now nowadays in politics and administration in Poland. So this CSIS was a... Trick. Yes, CSIS is the is the school of um, of Polish uh, uh, decision makers on foreign policy, apparently. Yes, it's a very good school. <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Um, and I have to say I'm very happy to see that uh, this uh, Polish-American dialogue on issues that matter for both the United States and the European Union um, is being inaugurated. Uh, Poland is uh, very much interested in the run-up to our presidency of the European Union, which will start on 1st of July next year, um, to uh, initiate and to step up dialogue with our key uh, partner, uh, the United States. We are also very much interested um, in the context of the new architecture in the European Union, uh, the new architecture that should provide uh, the European Union with uh, uh, one single telephone number, as somebody used to say, somebody famous. Perhaps for the time being we will not have a single telephone line, but we'll at least have a switchboard. Uh, so that should help. Um, uh, but uh, to say it seriously, we are very much interested that uh, the transatlantic dialogue between the Union and, um, and uh, uh, the United States is, um, is seen as a vital part of our respective foreign uh, policies, and we look forward to the upcoming summit in Lisbon between uh, the Union leaders and, um, and President Obama. Let me say a few, I will mention, I mean, my remarks I can divide into three points, basically. I want to tell you a few words about the context in which the, the Eastern Partnership was born um, and still exists. Um, secondly, I want to tell you a bit about what uh, the Eastern Partnership entails, of course, without going to into too much into technical details, but we can come to that if you wish during the discussions. And thirdly, I want to say what uh, next we can expect for Eastern Partnership, what would be the, the future of Eastern Partnership. Now, um, since I have about, uh, well, I should finish in seven minutes, I will not do that, but let's say 12 minutes, if you allow me. All Deputy Foreign Ministers will take as long as they like. Okay, so okay, very good, thank you. First of all, about the context. Um, we all know that the biggest success of the European Union has been its transformative power. So that the Union has been able to embrace new democracies and transform countries from Greece, Iberian Peninsula, to countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And this has been a resounding success. And even the most uh, fervent Eurosceptics in, uh, in London would admit that. So uh, this is something uh, which should be a lesson also in 
uh, designing the project for partner countries in our neighborhood. We uh, have, uh, together with Sweden, uh, thought uh, back in 2008 that since the topic of neighborhood has become so vital, it was also vital because our friends uh, in France, Spain and Italy thought that they had to construct a much bigger uh, sort of agenda for the common neighborhood in the south, so in the Mediterranean. It was a very opportune moment for Poland and Sweden to come up with a proposal to develop a sort of new relationship, a, a set of a new perspective for countries which uh, are bordering uh, the European Union on the east. There is one distinction that is being sometimes made between the south neighborhood in Europe and the east neighborhood. The south are the, na the neighbors of Europe and the neighbors on the east are, um, are European neighbors. That's, that's a difference and this is something we underline, although of course sometimes this is not a very popular uh, assumption. Um, so uh, why Poland and Sweden? In fact, uh, the project of Eastern Partnership, as it has been developing, um, was uh, getting ripe during a very successful uh, presidency, the Czech presidency, which helped uh, make European, uh, Eastern Partnership a reality. Uh, in fact, there were a few other countries that were very much interested in developing such a common agenda uh, for Europe um, in its Eastern neighborhood. But Poland and Sweden, I think this is a good duo. Why? Sweden, a country which is seen widely uh, as the model of good governance, uh, a successful uh, e economically, um, a very uh, open democracy, one which scores, scores best uh, in uh, various leagues on uh, quality of life and quality of governance, transparency and so on. Poland, uh, one of the countries, the biggest of new member states, now currently the seventh largest uh, uh, economy in the European Union. This is a bit of statistical effect, of course, of the crisis because some countries are sort of going down and Poland is what you call the Green Island, uh, the only country last year with economic growth and now the fastest growing economy together with Germany in Europe in 2010. But nevertheless, Poland uh, is a good example of successful transformation, a country which is, um, which is very much interested in developing um, what we call the West on our eastern border. We define the success of Polish foreign policy by saying that if we have the West on both sides of our borders, we will be um, uh, very secure, one of the most secure and best placed um, countries in the world. So um, those two countries developed a common agenda back in 2008 in a climate which was not very conducive to bold, bold projects. Uh, the impact of the economic crisis was already felt and it's still being felt. Uh, by the way, this crisis is affecting also our eastern neighbors very badly and of course this should be, I hope it will be part of our discussions as well today because part of the international response has to be to tackle in, in fact in the short term and medium term the effects of the current crisis in a way which would lead uh, to uh, a su successful economic transformation. There was also what we call the f enlargement fatigue or the fatigue with the Polish plumber. You know, the famous story with the Polish plumber in France that was supposed to invade the bathtubs of the French uh, families and that was uh, supposed to overtake jobs from, um, from, um, uh, from labor markets, from people in, in Western Europe. And of course, the same sort of fear, or the same sort of anxiety applies to any openness that we can propose towards uh, neighboring uh, countries. And of course this, uh, this openness philosophy uh, was not difficult for, to accept for some uh, and uh, is still uh, very much a fragile uh, process and a fragile issue. We can very well see this when it comes to the discussion about uh, future enlargement of the European Union, for example, to the Western Balkans. Then um, two other aspects uh, that uh, I have to mention when we talk about the context. Um, Russia. Russia is uh, a key partner for the European Union. Poland is one of those countries that wants, that is most uh, interested in having a very good comprehensive relationship between Russia and the European Union. And of course, uh, recent uh, Polish-Russian reconciliation should be helpful in this and should uh, make everybody 
uh, more certain about good intentions and it should also help us to overcome uh, difficulties that we have seen uh, in the past. And uh, without, um, this goes without saying that Poland um, has been open-minded about participation of Russia in um, projects of Eastern Partnership if Russia uh, wished so. The um, last element, the, the, con the last contextual element is the realization, and this is present in the conclusions of the last European summit, the last European Council last week, which was the first high-level or top-level discussion about uh, foreign policy. Um, and one conclusion was very clear. Neighborhood policy and neighborhood is crucial for credibility of Union's foreign policy. If you read uh, the, the text of the Council conclusions, and I recommend to everybody who is interested in European foreign policy to do that because they actually, this time, they are quite short and quite readable. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I recommend to you reading that because it is also very clear about strategic importance of economic and social transformation in um, countries, uh, in our Eastern partners. It is, cr it is very clear about the need, for example, for Ukraine to progress on the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, and it's very clear on other elements which are crucial. Uh, and those elements basically form one clear notion that neighborhood policy is the key to success. This is a litmus test for the newly born uh, European external representation. Now, let me pass to the um, to the, uh, to the, the, to the uh, to the discussion or to the uh, element which which is exactly which is uh, which is about uh, the content of uh, of Eastern Partnership. Uh, because if we wanted to make it very simple, and it's always uh, it is a very complicated and complex uh, process as always in the European Union, uh, we can make it quite simple if we say this is about political association. So uh, I've enhanced political dialogue on issues from security issues to political uh, politics, democracy, and uh, common uh, common positions uh, on uh, world issues, on the issues of common interest between the Eastern partners uh, and the European Union. And here the talks are quite advanced with Ukraine, uh, the talks are quite advanced with Moldova, uh, and uh, the, the Caucasus countries started uh, similar negotiations in uh, July uh, this year. The second element, which proves to be the most uh, difficult one, is the visa liberalization. Uh, Moldova is now the second uh, country after Ukraine that started a visa dialogue with the EU in June 2010. In, uh, um, between, Rush, Ru uh, between EU and Georgia, a visa facilitation agreement was also signed in July. Why it is difficult, I don't need to tell you. The context of economic crisis is not helpful. Uh, but also uh, visa openness um, on the part of the European Union requires that a lot of conditions are met. And uh, those conditions in case of some of Eastern partners are not easy to fulfill. Uh, and even if they, are, uh, if they are possible to fulfill, it will take time, a lot of resources, and it requires uh, a complete um, overhaul of the administrative capacity, border management capacity of some of those uh, countries. One um, element which also has to be kept in mind is that um, uh, visa facilitation um, is um, um, is only a sort of uh, is 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 an element. It's a it's a sign. It's a, it's not visa liberalisation. It's not the same as visa free travel. Uh, and uh, this is certainly. <coughs> Um, an element which has to be kept in mind since the visa liberalization is the ultimate goal for, um, for those countries and obviously uh, this is something also which would make uh, the European Union far more credible for the societies in, uh, uh, in Eastern uh, neighbors. Thirdly, uh, there is a very, a very um, uh, difficult element which is the um, uh, free trade uh, talks. Uh, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements that should be uh, signed between the Union and, um, and uh, the Eastern partners. We have to remember that uh, Polish accession, Hungarian accession, Czech accession, it all started with uh, free trade agreements. 
Uh, they may be difficult to swallow for the less developed countries in the beginning, but they are a necessary part of the package if you want to become uh, a partner closely linked to the European Union and perhaps to have a European membership perspective in the future. Because those agreements essentially mean that you adopt a set of norms, set of rules that exist in the single market, and there's no other way uh, if you want to uh, become a member state or even a close partner like Norway or uh, Iceland uh, in the future. Uh, this is, of course, the, also the most difficult element, as I said, uh, because there are lots of vested interests. And we can very well see, for example, in case of Ukraine, that uh, Ukraine, at the current speed, would, it would take 10 years before it signs such an agreement with, um, with, the, Uni uh, with uh, the European Union. And, of course, this is highly unsatisfactory and uh, we hope it will be a reason uh, for a serious uh, consideration in, uh, in Kiev. On the other hand, we can see cases like Moldova, which during two or three negotiation sessions achieved as much as Ukraine during three years of negotiations. So I believe there is a scope for fast progress, and this progress is necessary if those countries were to be considered in the future um, uh, close partners of the European Union. There is also a large part of the necessary cooperation between the Union and those countries which is related to energy. And as we speak today, I believe Ukraine will sign, uh, will become a member of the, uh, of the Energy Community Treaty. Uh, Moldova uh, became uh, a full member of uh, the ECT in March 2010. There is also a lot of multilateral cooperation on the four platforms that uh, provide uh, uh, assistance and technical advice um, on everything from border management to uh, phytosanitary issues. Um, a very important part of that is the people-to-people -people contacts and dialogue with civil society, and this is an area also where we hope the United States would be interested to take part, and the think tank community and civil society um, uh, from the U.S. would be interested to, to be present there. Uh, uh, there are also uh, other elements of, uh, in those uh, discussions uh, in the multilateral platforms between Eastern partners and the European Union where we believe uh, the American partners would be interested uh, to take part. This could, be, for this could concern, for example, SME uh, cooperation, regional energy markets, energy efficiency, uh, prevention and preparedness for uh, response to natural and man-made disasters and also good environmental governance, for example. These are just ideas where the U.S. could potentially be interested uh, to uh, cooperate, and uh, we very much hope it will be uh, the case. I should also mention, um, uh, just to speed up my, con uh, my presentation, that um, uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, has grown now and become mature also with the help of European Investment Bank, which is the public bank of the European Union, uh, which has provided a facility of 1.5 um, billion euro. Um, um, it's a facility called Eastern Partners Facility, which is earmarked for financing of investments in uh, Eastern Partnership countries, and this is on top of uh, the money already provided by the EIB um, for the five-year uh, programming uh, period. Now, um, let me um, say that uh, what I identify in the coming weeks and months as a crucial test for Eastern Partnership um, uh, is twofold. First of all, the elections in Moldova in uh, in November, where we very much hope for uh, a democratic, democratic process, where we very much hope for uh, the outcome of the elections, which would help uh, Moldova to progress on the way uh, to, um, to association with the European Union. Uh, and this will be also a test for the international community, whether we are able and willing to support Moldova in its transition. And I believe Moldova can become really the the best example, the landmark of Eastern Partnership, a first country in, among the Eastern partners who, can ha who could have a credible perspective one day to join the European Union. So it's a big test ahead of us in the coming weeks. Minister Sikorski will travel next week to Chisinau. There will be a meeting of uh, foreign ministers from the European Union, so-called Group of Friends of Moldova. And uh, Poland is very much engaged in helping Moldova, not only financially, but also with technical assistance, for example, on border management. And we think this is highly uh, important. The second element is, of course, 
uh, we have to be um, we have to understand that um, this is not a one-way street, uh, the process of uh, bringing these countries, those countries, closer to the European uh, Union. We can also see some backtracking, we can see some negative developments. I'm especially concerned in recent weeks uh, to see um, the, uh, the developments concerning uh, freedom of press in Ukraine. Uh, we are concerned also to see uh, which I mentioned already, the, uh, this perhaps a, a lack of political will to progress with uh, free trade um, talks. This is, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, um, uh, quite important and uh, Brussels is observing this with a lot of anxiety um, and um, we have to remember that in the current media age all the, uh, all the events and all the um, Sort of, and the, we, we are living in the global context, global community, and it, there's no doubt that any news about, uh, about any country can be very high, um, on, can be very visible, uh, no matter where we, uh, where we are. And uh, in, this, uh, in this context, of course, um, I have to say there are also encouraging signs uh, in the age when um, whether you can sell your bonds is the basic criterion of economic success. Um, we, of course, are satisfied to see and happy to see that Ukraine managed to sell uh, for the first time, I believe, in a couple of years, its uh, government bonds, which is a good uh, sign of progress in, um, in stabilization of its economy. Now, um, the last element, what next? First of all, we will inaugurate the meeting of Group of Friends of Eastern Partnership uh, next week in Brussels, where the U.S. will be one of uh, uh, the partners. Uh, invited, and as I mentioned, we are very much hopeful that the U.S. will uh, become um, one of those countries that will be interested in taking part in concrete projects. Uh, there is also um, a forthcoming um, summit between the European Union and the U.S. I hope that perhaps uh, if both sides agree, um, the common agenda um, in Eastern Europe could be part of this uh, discussion and could be an element uh, interesting for both uh, sides. Um, thirdly, um, we ha will have uh, now a review, a policy review of the European neighborhood policy. It already started. Uh, you can expect a Polish contribution in the coming weeks or days even. Um, and um, we will certainly uh, trying to strengthen Eastern partnership. Uh, we will try to strengthen the, uh, the uh, instruments available for Eastern partners, uh, uh, instruments of technical assistance, uh, financing of technical assistance from, uh, from the European Union because it has always been the rule that if you expect somebody to fulfill the acquis communautaire, the EU regulations, then you provide also concrete assistance uh, to, to them. This was the case in Poland and other uh, East, uh, Central European countries in the 1990s, and it should be the case now uh, in, uh, among the Eastern partners. And um, we will have um, next summit of Eastern Partnership in Budapest in May. Uh, this is a very uh, opportune, uh, well, this is a very good um, um, uh, set up with a very good uh, environment in 2011 because first you will have the Hungarian presidency of the European um, of the Council of the European Union and then Polish presidency. Um, uh, the Hungarian colleagues have invited uh, Prime Minister Tusk to be the co-host of the summit in uh, Budapest and Poland together with Hungary will very much like to work hand in hand to uh, prepare the uh, Eastern Partnership Mark II or Eastern Partnership uh, sequel uh, to, uh, to make it uh, uh, even more better targeted to the needs of uh, our Eastern uh, partners. And uh, we will, during the Polish presidency, provide for the first time an opportunity uh, for meetings at the ministerial level between uh, sectorial ministries. So there will be a series of meetings for, let's say, ministers of agriculture from, minister, uh, from the European Union and Eastern partners, for ministers of finance, for ministers um, of, um, of environment, and so on and so forth. This will be for the first time such, a, um, such an offensive of charm and let's, let's hope uh, a mutual charm uh, the, in, uh, during the Polish presidency, uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is certainly uh, perhaps 
going to bring uh, uh, a more openness and more uh, sort of concrete effects in um, in this uh, cooperation. I will stop here, and I'm sorry that uh, it was so long. No. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the minister.